Good morning. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us as we continue on our our journey through the book of Numbers. Just uh, just kind of a reminder as to where we were, uh, where we kind of finished up last time in chapters five and six. We talked about the cleaning of the camp. As it looks like we're getting ready to move on. Uh, talked about uh, making sure those who were unclean were outside of camp until they could be made clean. Talked about relationships within the camp with one another and how that dealt with. And then we talked a little bit about that kind of a, a strange section about the test for an adulterous woman and then ended up talking about the, the Nazarite vow and then Aaron's blessing at the end of chapter 6. Chapter 7, with the exception of Psalm 119, is the longest uh, chapter in our Bible. Numbers chapter 7. But don't panic, we're not going to read all of it. Uh, you're not going to have to listen to me try to pronounce all these names and, and try to figure all that out. But we are going to look at uh, at just a few things within it or some, some of the major things within it. And, and I hope that we're continuing to kind of read through this as, as we're going. And so if you have your Bibles and you have them open, Numbers chapter 7, we're going to read the first 11 verses. Let's start there. On the day when Moses had finished setting up the tabernacle and had anointed and consecrated it with all its furnishings, and had anointed and consecrated the altar with all its utensils, the chiefs of Israel, heads of their fathers' houses, who were the chiefs of the tribes, who were over those who were listed, approached, and they brought their offerings before the Lord, six wagons and twelve oxen, a wagon for every two chiefs, and for each one an ox. They brought them before the tabernacle. Then the Lord said to Moses, Accept these from them, that they may be used in the service of the tent of meeting, and give them to the Levites to each man according to his service. So Moses took the wagons and the oxen and gave them to the Levites. Two wagons and four oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon according to their service. And four wagons and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari according to their service under the direction of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. But to the sons of Kohath he gave none because they were charged with the service of the holy things that had to be carried on the shoulder. The chief offered offerings for the dedication of the altar on the day it was anointed. And the chief offered their uh, offerings before the altar. And the Lord said to Moses, They shall offer their offerings one chief each day for the dedication of the altar. We're going to stop right there. We're going to pick up uh, towards the end of Numbers chapter 7 in just a little bit. But we're going to stop there for just a minute. So I want to start with the timing. The timing of this event. Uh, really goes back, you know, if we were going to try to set this up chronologically and write it, it would be right at the end of Exodus. After the tabernacle is set up, you know, as, as, as this becomes the day of dedication, kind of. So at, right, right around that time. Another commentary that I was looking at uh, in conjunction with this said, you know, chronologically this could, be, could take us back to the uh, Leviticus 10, you know, around Nadab and Abihu and all of that uh, and, and what all went on there. So that, that's, that's kind of, uh, I hope that kind of indicates for us that we can't just take sections of this out, right? That, that this uh, functions, really uh, Genesis all the way through Deuteronomy, functions as one unit. And there are a lot of things that go on, especially from Exodus to, De- to Deuteronomy, Exodus through Numbers, really, that, that kind of uh, feed off of each other and they're, they're kind of related and, and intertwined. So I just want to kind of, just a just refresher on that. And so we may think about what's going on here as these chiefs come and they bring their offerings on this dedication. Well, we see that they bring wagons and oxen. Uh, six wagon, twelve oxen. Right? And so we begin to distribute those and then Moses, or God tells Moses that you just, you take them and you distribute them to the Levites as per their duties, what they're going to be doing in service of the tabernacle. So two wagons and four oxen go to Gershon. Gershon, remember as we talked about how all this is set up, uh, this this group, Gershon, is going to be responsible for all of the hangings of the the tabernacle, the curtains, uh, the coverings, all of the kind of the the, uh, kind of the soft coverings, right? The, The soft part of the tabernacle, they're going to be in charge of. So they get two wagons and four oxen. And that's how they're going to move the tabernacle when that comes time. Uh, Merari gets four wagons 
and uh, and eight oxen because they're going to carry all the hardware, all of the, the bases, all the lumber, all the frames, all of those things they're going to carry. Uh, and so they uh, obviously may need these this much to, to move this, to move this structure. But when it comes to Kohath, they get zero because nothing that they're going to carry is supposed to go on a cart. It's all supposed to be carried by the poles, you know, and, and carried on their shoulders. The holy furnishings, the holy things, the Ark of the Covenant, the table of, uh, that holds the bread of presence, the incense altar, uh, the lamp, uh, the bronze uh, altar out in the, in the courtyard that we don't even have drawn on here, but the, the, bronze, uh, the bronze altar, that those things all get carried by poles. If you go back to Exodus uh, 25 through 27 when it talks about the construction of these items, it will say there are rings on there and here's where the poles go and this is how it's to be carried. Not supposed to be carried any other way. They're supposed to take very good care of these things and carry them personally. Um, you might remember that there's an incident later on in the, in the life of Israel where, where David is having the, the Ark of the Covenant moved and it's on an ox cart. And as the ox stumbles, and it looks like the, the ark's going to fall off, a man by the name of Uzzah reaches up to steady it, and Uzzah is killed immediately. right? Because that unholy coming in contact with the holy is where judgment happens. This is one of those things where this is how this is supposed to be taken care of. They're supposed to be carried by the poles. The, the, a, good, a good portion of the rest of this chapter, from 12 through, uh, really all the way down through 88, talks about each of the of the tribes offerings and as you go through there you're going to see well here, here are all the tribes and if you remember the the tribes of Israel that's that's good but you're going to notice that the tribe of Levi is not one that brings an offering it's because the tribe of Levi uh, this is their offering it is service to the tabernacle they are going to be dedicated to that service Aaron and his sons to serve as priests the rest of these, uh, the rest of these, to, to serve in, in taking care of, moving, transporting, setting back up the tabernacle. So that's gonna that's gonna keep going. There's a summary of what's given, uh, found it at uh, in chapter seven, uh, beginning of verse eighty four. This was the dedication offering for the altar on the day when it was anointed from the chiefs of Israel. Here they come. Twelve silver plates, twelve silver basins, twelve golden dishes, each silver plate weighing 130 shekels, each basin 70. All the silver vessels, 2,400 shekels according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Twelve golden dishes full of incense weighing 10 shekels apiece according to the shekel of the sanctuary. And all the gold dishes being 120 shekels. All the cattle for the burnt offerings, 12 bulls, 12 rams, 12 male lambs a year old with their grain offering, and 12 male goats for a sin offering. And all the cattle for the sacrifice of peace offerings, 24 bulls, 60 rams, 60 male goats, 60 male lambs a year old. This was the dedication offering for the altar after it was anointed. There's the kind of the summary of that. If you go back from verse 12 down to verse 83, this lists each of the tribes, and this is what they brought, right? And this is and it's who brought it, and then then on this day, and on this day, and on this day, and it gets, goes through the whole detail for us. Um, but the summary is 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 really what I, where I want to kind of kind of rest for a second, and I want us to notice that uh, giving and these offerings. Is a part of who the people of God are, and it's been that way for a long time. I want us to stop and think for just a minute. Uh, if we were to read about the construction of the tabernacle and of the courtyard around the tabernacle, and we think about the the uh, the the garments for the priest and how all these things are done, and and there's some really elaborate things. Think about the Ark of the Covenant, a box made of, of acacia wood uh, overlaid with gold inside and out, a solid gold top that sits on there, the mercy seat with the, with the cherubim, and it's all out, of, out of solid gold. And there's a lot of elaborate and very expensive things uh, in this, and, 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 and those kinds of things that, that we see all through that. And all of those things that are that are part of the construction of the tabernacle 
All of those things are given by the people of Israel. There's a, a place where God says, okay, you begin to, to take these contributions for the sanctuary. And uh, they had more than they needed. And then on top of that, on top of all of this, that, that everything that, that's been made so far, on top of that are these offerings. And I don't have a monetary value for this. I'm sure we could look it up and find out, but I mean, it, it seems pretty extravagant. Where do they get this stuff? Well, most of us probably already know the answer to that question. Is found back in Exodus chapter 11, where God's threatening the final plague, and he tells Moses to tell the people of Israel, listen, you go ask of your neighbors, and they will give you things. They're going to give you gold. They'll give you, uh, they'll give you uh, all, of, all of the stuff that you're going to need. They're going to just hand it over. Israel had flocks and herds while they were in Egypt, so that, that part of that comes with them. But I think that they begin to see that all of this stuff has been given to them by God, the God who rescued them and redeemed them. And whatever they've been given is to be used in His service. I think that's something that, that uh, this congregation gets and gets well. Let me give you an example. Uh, there's never been a time. There's never been a time that I can remember in the life of this congregation when there was not a need that wasn't met over, uh, over and above what was requested. Just a few weeks ago, uh, just a few weeks ago, we announced that we were going to start a food pantry. And within uh, practically no time, the shelves of that food pantry that are over in the next building over there are running over because we have people who are just, com just continually donating and donating and donating. This has been, this is the most generous congregation I have ever seen and ready to give at, at, for, for, for whatever. Of people all the time going, do you know of somebody that's in need? Because we really like to give and help. And man, that's a that's a beautiful thing to see. Because it's a reflection of who God is. I want us to think for just a minute about why it is that we give. And and I know that there'll be people who say, you know, well, we give because we're commanded to give. And okay, I'm I'm, I'm with you. But is there more to it than that? Because when we say I, I want to. We give because we're commanded to give. I'm, I'm just going to be just just going to be up front here. Say then, how does that how does that fit in with Paul saying that I want you to give not under compulsion, but cheerfully, right? And I get that. I'm not I'm not disparaging anybody who has that view. Please understand that. There are a lot of commands that we have in Scripture to do things. Those uh, commands aren't necessarily just so that we'll do them. Right? There's a purpose behind them. We've talked about this before. We're going to talk about this continually as we continue on through this book and even into others. The commands that God has given us are for our good and for His glory. The commands that God has given to Israel, uh, if, if we've read back in, into Exodus and on into Leviticus, is that this is what it means to be God's people. This is what it means to shape us, to shape Israel, into the people of God. Why do we give? Because that's where it makes us like God. God's a giver. It seems like the, that the people begin to get this, right? It seems like in, in this case, and there's some really, really bright spots in that, uh, in, in the Exodus, where people go, oh, we're giving, right? God gave this to us and we're giving. God's the giver, God's the sustainer. We give to others, we share with others because God's been gracious to us. That that's that's makes us who we are. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, right? The, Give to the one who asks from uh, ask of you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. These passages from the Sermon on the Mount that are meant to shape us into the people of God, shape us into kingdom people. We give because that's who God is. God's a giver, and, and I just think that that. As we look at this in chapter 7, of all of the things that are given, and then again, this is above and beyond what has already been given for the tabernacle, for the, for the clothing of the priest, for all the furnishings, for everything that goes on. It's all a free will offering of, of the people of Israel. 
we see this again where they're coming and they're giving. And why is that? Because God's a giver. And, and that's just one of those things that, that kind of becomes, uh, hopefully becomes ingrained in us, that we want to be God's people. We want to be like God. And so this is in one way in which we do that. Um, I want to go ahead and move on to, to the end of chapter 7, verse 89. The final, uh, the, the final verse, and there's a lot, there's really a lot to see in this little verse. When Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim, and it spoke to him. I love the way this is translated. I'm not a Hebrew guy. I'm, I'm, it's not like I could go and, and translate it myself or, uh, without a, a lot, a lot of work. I like the, I do like the way this is translated. In one way, um, the English Standard Version is the is the version I've been using all through this. Uh, I, I, there's one section I don't really care for in, in this, and I'll, I'll tell you what that is in a minute. But it's it's really probably more me than it is anything else. I understand what it is they're doing. It just it, I like the NIVs better in that in that uh, in that sense, but we'll talk about that in just a second. It says that when Moses goes in to speak with God, Raymond Brown is a is an author of one of the commentaries that I've been reading along uh, through Numbers. He says you can almost picture Moses being excited to go in and tell God what all is going on. Right, he's he's ready to go in and and, and talk with God, and it, but it's almost like the way this is is worded. It's almost like you never got to. When Moses went into the to the tent of meeting to speak with the Lord, what happened? He heard God. He heard the voice of God. And he's quiet. Right? Here's the, the part, and I'm, again, I'm being nitpicky. And the ESV said, uh, and it spoke to him. Those are the final words in the ESV. Uh, I know what they're doing, right? But the voice is what they're taking as, as the antecedent of the pronoun it. Right, so that that seems to match. Uh, I, I just like the the NIVs better, where it says, "And he spoke to him." Right, God spoke to Moses. I want us to think about this in contrast to the other religions that are around Israel uh, at this time, and that will continue to be around Israel. Uh, temples set up with the image of a god in them where people go or they have the, the image of that God in, in their own dwellings and they talk to that God. But that God doesn't talk back. He has nothing to say. Habakkuk is one of those places where this really comes out, uh, <laughs> really comes out in full force uh, when he starts talking about idols. Let me just turn over there real quick. Habakkuk chapter 2. Uh, starts in verse 18. What prophet is an idol when its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake, and to a silent stone, Arise. Can this teach? Behold, it's overlaid with gold and silver. There is no breath in it at all. It's almost like you know, Habakkuk says, you know, I feel sorry for people who come into this idol and they just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and expect something because the idol is nothing. The idol is dead. It has nothing to say. It's wood, it's stone, it's metal. There's nothing there. Israel's going to encounter other people who have these gods set up and, and they're going to talk to them. And they're going to talk to them and they're going to talk to them and they're going to talk to them but they're not going to hear anything. Habakkuk answers that question. That, that kind of rhetorical statement that he makes of going, you know, what what's the profit of an idol? In, in verse 18, when he gets to verse 20, and says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent. Because Israel's God, our God, is alive. And he has something to say. There's a, a cycle that goes through all of these books, and, and particularly here in Numbers, because we talked about the fact that uh, the Lord spoke is a phrase that is used you know, over a hundred times in the book of Numbers alone. But it's listening and responding to God. And we think about this as the way we, as we read through these things. We'll find that this is what God said to do. 
and this is what they did, right? Uh, with with the tabernacle, this is what God shown them has shown them, and this is how they set it up, just according to the pattern that God showed Moses on the mountain, right? This is what God told them to do, and this is what they did, and there's a listening and responding cycle, and that's the cycle we want to be in. Right? We listen to what God has to say, and we respond, and we do something with it. Reminds me of James, right? James uh, in his letter who says, don't just be hearers of the word, right? Don't just listen, but do. But be doers of the word. Now, granted, we have got to hear it before we can do it, but hearing it without doing it doesn't do us any good. Again, Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount, the one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is a wise man. The one who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is the fool. Right? So it's that listening and responding. So I want us to stop for just a second think about how we listen, or if we listen. And I think we do. But how do we listen for God? We've mentioned it already. The Lord spoke. is mentioned over a hundred times in the book of Numbers. God has spoken. We have those words here. We have we have our, our Bibles with us where God has spoken. We need to listen to what He said. Right? We need to we need this maybe that's the posture we start with is listening. Right? We listen to that. We we uh, we also listen to God and we watch God and we learn about God. We learn what God is like and what God does in the person of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, right? verse 1. It starts right off. Long ago, various, in various ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He's appointed heir of all things. God revealed most definitively in the person of Jesus. Scripture is meant to reveal God to us. It's meant to lead us to its author. And Jesus is also meant to illuminate for us who God is and to reveal God to us. We want to know what God thinks about situations. We want to know what God would do in situations. We want to know uh, how God reacts, how God interacts. We look at Jesus. We listen to Him. We watch Him. He has something to say. God has given us His Spirit that lives within us. Is there a listening that needs to go on there? A listening to the prompting of the things that we need to do. You may disagree with that. I, I happen to think that the Holy Spirit prompts us and that we need to listen. We need to listen to that. I, I've heard Randall say this, and I, I couldn't agree more. I'm going, maybe, that, maybe that coming into our mind of, hey, I should call and check on somebody is the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Maybe I should go and see this person, maybe that's the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Maybe we need to listen. And not just listen, but to respond. Another way is that, that, uh, that God speaks to us, I believe that God speaks to us, through people that He places in our lives. I, I think that, that we think about the providence of God. We think about God uh, uh, placing people and, and having us in situations where we can hear. I think that's I think that's another way that we listen. I think that uh, that listening is one of those things that we need to do. Maybe we need to do more of, um, more so than talking. That from a guy who's standing here in front of the camera talking for a Sunday school class, right? But 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 think about that for just a minute, right? I, I know James is talking about interpersonal relationships, and when he says. That, that, hey, let everyone be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to become angry, right? right? Quick to hear, that we listen. With, uh, when we use our words, when we, we, we come and we talk, that's how we identify ourselves, that's how we present ourselves, that's how we defend ourselves. Maybe we should spend some time sitting silent before God with no defense. And just and just sit. Maybe we listen to what he has to say. And 
just and just listen to it before we start. And I don't, there's nothing wrong. Please do not do not uh, don't hear me say that we shouldn't talk to God. We should always talk to God, right? We should talk to God often. Paul's uh, Paul's admonition to the Thessalonians is pray without ceasing. Right? Uh, Paul in Philippians who says, you know, be anxious for nothing, but in everything. By prayer and petition, make your request be make your request known to God. You know, Peter says, "Cast your cares on Him, for He cares for you." We know we're supposed to confess to Him. We know we're supposed to to intercede for others, right? But on, on their behalf to God, that we pray for others, that we pray for the things that we need. Jesus taught that, right? Jesus taught that in the Sermon on the Mount. Give us today our daily bread, right? We're supposed to, but it shouldn't be a one sided. There's got to be some listening involved. So one other thing before we we exit that, we talk about uh, one of the, what what else Moses uh, what, what else uh, probably strikes Moses uh, gets Moses' attention, or at least some of the things that could be possibly going through Moses' mind as he approaches the tent of meeting in the Ark of the Covenant, where he hears the voice of God from above the cherubim on the mercy seat. This is a reminder, okay? This is a reminder that God is king. I believe it's in the Psalms, and I know that's in, in other passages about God being enthroned above the cherubim. The Ark of the Covenant was not an idol, right? It was not the image of God. It was the footstool of God's throne. Right? God came and spoke to them from above the mercy seat. God is enthroned. God is their king. God is also their uh, their uh, uh, the one with which they have uh, entered a covenant agreement. Think about what's kept in the ark. At this point, what's kept in the ark? Uh, the Ten Commandments. Right? The tablets of stone. The covenant. You know, the book of the covenant is going to be kept by the by the ark of the covenant. This is a practice in the ancient Near East of of treaties being kept by the throne of the king, and the covenant is in some form, in some ways, very very much related to treaties of the ancient Near East. God saying, "This is what I will do for you. This is what I expect from you, and this is the record of it that we will keep, that you will read and review." And that we will keep this covenant. He's, he is their king. He is their 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 uh, their, their their covenant maker, uh, the covenant keeper. Also, with the Ten Commandments, we see God is their teacher. The commands that God gives, and there's a lot of them, are meant to teach Israel what it's like to be his, what it means to be His people. It's to train them to be His people. They're to be different from the nations around them, not for the sake of being different, but being different from the nations around them because they're God's people. Right? And they're to be a reflection of God, what it means to be His people. Also, if we'll remember what else is in the, the Ark of the Covenant, is a, uh, is a jar of manna. There's a jar of manna to remind Israel that God is their provider. On the top of on the top of the, the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat. Where the high priest comes and he and he, he, he sprinkles the blood of the of the sin offering for atonement. It's a reminder of this is where we receive forgiveness. All of these things are wrapped up right here. Right here. Which again, not to be redundant, but this is the point of the story. God with us. God is our king our provider, the one who has made the covenant, the one who is always faithful, the, our teacher, the provider, and one who offers forgiveness. It's all right there. Uh, I want to move on into chapter 8. Uh, chapter 8, uh, the first four verses, we see again that cycle that we talked about just a second ago of listening and responding. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and say to him, When you set up the lamps... Seven lamps shall give light in front of the lampstand. And Aaron did so. He set up its lamps in front of the lampstand as the Lord commanded Moses. This was the workmanship of the lampstand, hammered work of gold. 
from its base to its flowers. It was a hammered work according to the pattern that the Lord had shown Moses. So he made the lampstand. You see that cycle, right? God told Moses, this is what you tell Aaron. This is what you do. Aaron set it up that way. Not only that, but this is how God told you to make the lampstand to start with. And that's how the lampstand was made. There's that 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 cycle. The one that hope that we want to be in of listening and responding, listening and responding, listening and responding. The lampstand, I believe, if I got this right, the lampstand sits on the on the south side and is to give light towards its front. So it would be the altar of incense and the table with the bread of presence that, that it lights. That's uh, it's pure olive oil. It's to be lit every every night. It's supposed to shine in there. Uh, it's a reminder of the presence of God with them uh, and among them in the camp that they can see this within the tabernacle. I want to move on to the Levites. The Levites get a lot of attention, uh, a lot of attention in the book of Leviticus. If you can imagine that, and uh, and quite a bit and some more here. Right? We've talked about the Levites before. The Levites and their duty to deal with the tabernacle. Aaron and his sons are going to be the the, the priests and how the others have responsibilities around the tabernacle. And so we're, we're at the point where we're going we're gonna to set the Levites apart. And this is a visible thing for all of Israel to see right, of what's going to be done and how this is going to function. So I want us to read, uh, let's just read beginning in verse 5 and we'll stop, uh, we'll stop down here at about verse 13. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the Levites from among the people of Israel and cleanse them. Thus you shall do to them to cleanse them. Sprinkle the water of purification upon them. Let them go uh, with a razor over all their body and wash their clothes and cleanse themselves. And then let them take a bull from the herd and its grain offering, a fine flour mixed with oil. And you shall take another bull from the herd for a sin offering. And you shall bring the Levites before the tent of meeting and assemble the whole congregation of the people of Israel. When you bring the Levites before the Lord, the people of Israel shall lay their hands on the Levites. And Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord as a wave offering from the people of Israel, that they may do service, do the service of the Lord. Then the Levites shall lay their hands on the heads of bulls, and you shall offer one for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering, to the Lord to make atonement for the Levites. And you shall set the Levites before Aaron and his sons, and shall, uh, and shall offer them as a wave offering to the Lord. Okay. So, so here we have this, this ceremony. We've talked about this in Numbers already. That, uh, that the Levites, God is going to take the Levites in place of the firstborn of all of Israel. That goes on in, in the rest of chapter 8, or some more in chapter 8 talks about that. But, but this is what they're going to do, right? Uh, and so I, I want us to think about, about kind of about the ceremony here for just a minute, just kind of, I'm sure there's probably a lot more that we can draw from this than what I'm pulling out. But just some things that I want us to see. First, there's this outward. Right? There's an outward cleansing that goes on. Right? This is this is kind of elaborate, really. I mean, but it but it's a visual reminder, right, of, of this being clean and holy before God, holy in the presence of a holy God. And so they are to take this water of purification. Read about that back in Leviticus also. And, and they're to, to sprinkle that on them. Then they're to take a razor and shave their entire body. Then they're to wash their clothes, cleanse themselves again, and now they're ready. Right? This is a, a, a really a, a stark reminder right, of, of being clean and coming you know, in, into the presence of God. Then there's an inner. Then there's more of an inner cleansing, but still an outward ritual that goes along with this. And there's this ritual that goes with it. The sin offering and the burn offering and the grain offering. All of these offerings, by the way, if you go back and read Leviticus 1 through 4, talks about each of them. It talks about, about, about the process and, again, in stark detail of how this works. But, but I just want us to, to look at a few things here. The sin offering. All right, so you have the sin offering. This is for any unintentional sins that have been committed by the Levites so that these are forgiven so they can come into the service and come in to the, to, to the, to the presence of God and be in this kind of proximity with it. And you have a burnt offering. Now, the sin offering is, is, you know, right? We have the sin offering that's going to atone for the sins. The burnt offering. The burnt offering is a, uh, is kind of a, 
a sign. If, if, if I'm, I'm at, that may not be the right word, but it's at least it's a it's a it's a way of showing complete dedication. The burnt offering is completely burned. It's all given, and that's what that, that's what this is kind of a visual reminder that the, the tribe of Levi they are given to God, right? Total commitment here, and a grain offering which. Is, is is joyous and thankfulness those things go with it and then we have this this other kind of kind of strange thing maybe to us of Israel uh, the people of Israel to lay their hands on the Levites and offer them as a wave offering uh, to God there's a couple of things that, that go on here um, because we're going to see that the Levites turn around and they lay their hands on the sin offering and I think these two are related in this way. God has already told Israel that instead of their firstborn, he'll take the tribe of Levi. Levi serves as a substitution for firstborn. And so as Israel lay their hands on the Levites, it's an acknowledgement among themselves and before God that these, please accept them, in our place. Okay? In the place of our firstborn. Much the same way as the sin offering. The person who comes to offer a sin offering, as you read about this in Leviticus and as you see this here, is there to come in there to lay their hand on that animal, on that bull that's going to set, that's going to serve as substitute for them. The sin offering shows how serious God takes sin. That that of going, my sin is going to cause this, and that's not, you know, it's not. Well, hey, here, priest, go kill that bull for me. No, the priest guide them through the process, but the person who brings it kills it, and they have to see that. Burn offering, this complete commitment to God, is all right there. All of these things. Are, are, are right in there and, and we see this over and over and these sacrifices have a lot of meaning to them they're not supposed to be empty rituals these are, are really uh, supposed to illuminate the people of and, and kind of they get to understand what God thinks of sin they get to see what it looks like right and what this costs and then there's celebration with some of them right like the peace offering and the fellowship offering where it's a, a thankfulness for what God has done for them. And all these kinds of things, but these these all go together. I want to finish up chapter 8 after we talk about the uh, the substitution that's done, you know, in by Levi uh, and, and and hit something and I think has some pretty practical stuff for us. Uh, again, I don't care for the heading uh, that's that's in uh, the English Standard Version. It may be different in other ones. I, I don't I don't have one of those in front of me right now. But the, the heading reads the retirement of the Levites, which I think is a I think it's a, a not not a great heading. How's that? Uh, uh, I'll just leave it at that for a second. It says the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, "This applies to the Levites. From twenty-five years old and upward, they shall come to do uh, duty in the service, of the tent of meeting." All right, so twenty-five years. That's when they're twenty-five years old. This is when they come into the service of the tent of meat. Right? Remember, we've got Aaron and his sons that are going to serve as priests. The rest of the Levites are going to serve with the tabernacle also. And primarily what we've seen so far in, in service of the tabernacle is moving it. Right? Setting it up, tearing it down, taking it with them. So all of those kinds of things. And from age 50 years, they shall withdraw from the duty of the service and serve no more. So are they done? Are they done when it comes to, to this? They shall serve no more. They minister to their brothers in the tent of meeting by keeping guard, but they shall do no service. Thus you shall do to the Levites in assigning their duties. Okay. At 50, they're not done. At 50, they're done with this. They're done with, with packing up tearing down. They're done with, with loading and, and transporting and all of that. For 25 years, they've done this. Right? They will have done this. At age 50, they, they stop that part. But they don't stop everything. 
It says that they, they minister to their brothers in the tent of meeting by keeping guard. I have a couple of thoughts about that. And, and again, you may, may differ with me. But they keep guard. What are they guarding? They minister to their brothers by keeping guard. Are they guarding Israel? Are they guarding the tabernacle? And I think the answer to that is yes, both. The Levites are positioned where they are around the tabernacle to keep those who are not supposed to be there out. Not because they're afraid they're going to do damage to the tabernacle, but because they're afraid that their, their fellow Israelites are going to be killed if they go in there. Not just anyone goes there. Right? No. Not just anyone goes in and makes themselves at home in the tabernacle. As a matter of fact, there's only a few that can go in. There's only one that can go into here. When the high priest is, is anointed, only he goes in there and only then once a year. He doesn't go where he's not where he doesn't belong because when the unholy comes into contact with the holy, judgment happens. We talked about that a second ago with Uzzah. Uzzah touching the ark. Uzzah's not supposed to touch the ark. Nobody's supposed to touch the ark. And when Uzzah comes in contact with it, death. Nadab and Abihu did not do what they were supposed to do as they approached the holy God and they died. Part of what these Levites are going to do, these older Levites are going to do after age 50, they're going to guard this. They're going to help their brothers by keeping people who are not supposed to be in there out and they're to help the brothers within the tabernacle and those outside of it to keep in their Places. There's something else that I wonder about, and it's not spelled out in the text, and this is just my opinion. I wonder. It's the Levites don't quit being Levites. Right? They don't just they don't just stop. Say, That's it. Right? You're done. No, they, they continue. They just don't do this part anymore. What else do you think that they that they do? This is a guess. Right? Again, this is not spelled out in the text. This is a guess. This is my opinion. I think it to be uh, be borne out by other things that we find in Scripture. I wonder if maybe what some of the service of these Levites that are over 50 is is to coach the next generation. Right? This is a community of people. They live together. Right? They travel together. They do all these things together. I wonder if maybe some of these Levites who have done this for 25 years, as others come to, come of age and become, hey, it's their 25th birthday, it's time for them to start serving in the, in the tabernacle, and they go, listen, let me tell you some mistakes I made. Let me tell you a good way to do that. Let me talk to you about the responsibilities that you have. This is the first generation. Right? This is going to be the first generation that deals with this. Do you think that within 25 years they're going to have a little bit more knowledge and a little bit more uh, wisdom in how this is carried out? That they can pass on. That they can pass on to these guys who are 25 or maybe pass on before they get to be 25 to go, man, this would be, this is the way that this is done. We know because we've, we've kind of had to pioneer that. Again, this is my opinion. But I don't think that it's it's outside of what God has set up in other places. About one generation paving the way for another. One generation teaching another. I think that's something that we can what we can uh, we can learn from. As we get uh, as we get older we're going to become more and more aware of the physical limitations we have. Right? It doesn't seem like all that long ago for me when I could do just about anything and not worry about it. 
right? I mean, it was just like, that, that's nothing. Let me give you an example. Last Saturday, not, not yesterday, but a week ago, um, my dad and I, dad came down, and we were working on, uh, on Matt's pickup. And I spent a good portion of the day laying on the concrete driveway underneath that pickup as we did some, some big repair stuff. There was a time in my life when that wouldn't have bothered me much. But by the end of Saturday, right, by about 7 o'clock Saturday night, I was ready to quit because I, I couldn't move very well. Right? Joints began to hurt, and they didn't used to do that. So we're going to become aware of those physical limitations. But there's some things that we have to offer. Right? There's things that we have to offer about, uh, about what it's like to have lived in the service of God for the length of time that we have. Maybe we can be a little bit more transparent about the mistakes that we made. Maybe we can make the, the sailing a little bit easier for the next generation to come. Again, that's one of the things I love about this place. One of the things I love about Bella Vista is the amount of wisdom that we have and the amount of people who are willing to share that and are eager to share that and to try to make the sailing smoother for the next generation, to try to, to help the next generation because they're going to have struggles of their own that are going to be different from, from the previous generation. But some principles and some things that go along of going, listen, this is how we handle that. This is how we dealt with it. Or maybe this is how we tried to deal with it and it didn't work. Yeah. There's been a lot of generational segmentation in churches. And that's one of the things that, that I think that we see, hopefully see, uh, that, that we move away from. That it's not the young church and the old church. Right? And I don't mean to be indelicate to anybody. Right? But it's the church. The mixture of, of the old and the young, each learning from one another. There are things that, that we can learn from the generation before and the generation behind. But that we're in this together to grow the kingdom of God and that we learn from one another. That the generation that's ahead of it, that, that has gone before us, you know, that, that has plowed the way before us, have got some wisdom. And those who are coming behind us have also got some wisdom and some knowledge and some things that, that we hadn't thought of. But that we're in this together. And we're going to see this as a, as a faith uh, community, a faith family. Uh, that's what I've got for this morning. Thanks, thanks again for, uh, for walking through this with us. Uh, next week we'll pick up Numbers chapter 9 uh, and part of chapter 10 before... Uh, the next week we're going to start uh, start the move toward Canaan. Let's let's pray as we close. And again, thanks so much. If you have comments, questions, those kinds of things, the comment section on Facebook or on YouTube, uh, just put them on there. We'll we'll deal with them and we'll have those conversations. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so much that uh, that we can we can gather in a in in what we've seen. Uh, may have seen up till now as a very unconventional way. But we can still gather and we can, we can talk about the great God that you are and all that you've done. Father, we're thankful that you are our King. Help us to acknowledge your, uh, your Lordship and to submit to you. Help us to listen and respond. We're thankful that you uh, are, are where we find forgiveness that you were a giving God enough that you gave your own son. Thankful for your faithfulness as a covenant God and that the promise that you've made, uh, made to us, we know that you will keep. Help us to, to be good covenant people of yours. Help us to, to pass on our faith from generation to generation and to be fully dedicated and committed to who you are and who you would have us to be. Father, what we want most is to be your people. Help us to be shaped by 
by listening to you, help us to be shaped by the spirit that you've given us to be more and more like your son. And it's in his name that we pray.